is very much a graveyard of heroes. We have three men who gave their lives buried here. Michael Sadler, who we commemorate today. His brother, Dinny. And behind us here, Patrick Hackett, who was killed in Knock Row in 1921. But many other heroes of that important era are buried here as well. Just up here we have Tom and Mick Cuddy. Over here we have Tommy Carroll, Jim Gleason, Nicholas and Pat Moroni, Harry Bush is across the road. And there's many more as well, including members of Coming to Man. As well as Harry Bush across the road, we have Bill Boland, John Brett, Pat Strap, including men and women who would have been their heroes in the past. And men like Michael Cusick and Thomas Ryan, who they would have looked up to. As a young child, I'm sure many of you my age and older would remember meeting Big Jim Gleason, as we called him, in the shop. I often met Mick Cuddy, who always gave me five pence and told me how great a friend he was with my grandfather. I remember seeing Tommy Carroll sitting on his seat outside his shop. These were old men to me, but I knew in their youth they had done something important. These men had lived lives, but at my young age I knew nothing of their friends and comrades who never became old men. Today we commemorate one of those young men who never grew old, Michael Sadler. Michael was born in the parish of Cabo White in the townland of Tinahinchi in February 1894. His parents, Patrick and Amy, were small farmers. And in 1900 they bought a large farm in Redkenny Drangan. Pat Sadler became a member of the district council and life was comfortable enough for the Sadler family. Thirteen children were born to Tom and Amy, of which ten were still alive in the 1911 census. Pat and Amy had very strong republican and national ideals and instilled these in their children. As Michael and the rest of the Sadler children grew up around Drangan and Cunine, the strong nationalistic and Gaelic ideal and history of this particular parish further strengthened theirs. And I'm sure in May 1913, when the then 19 year old Michael watched with enthusiasm at the unveiling of the statue of the local Fenian and Land League hero Michael Cusick. For any visitors to the parish, this is not the GA Michael Cusick, but for us, a much more important figure. John Dillon, MP for the Irish Parliamentary Party and later leader after John Redmond's death in 1918, unveiled the statue and spoke about Cusick's role in the Fenian movement and the huge influence in the Land League, which later led to the Land Purchase Act. And now the promise of whole rule was achieved by Dillon and Redmond and the Parliamentary Party. Michael would have heard how Cusack had organised the biggest event Drangan had ever seen, before or since probably, when he organised a national demonstration with Land League founder Michael Davitt in this little village in May 1884, the same year as the other Michael Cusack was in Thurles, having found the GAA. Thousands upon thousands of people attended that meeting. The village itself was decorated with arches of laurel leaves and banners. One banner read, Shall tyrants be allowed to lay waste of temporary homes? Another read, A free land for a free people. And of course, it was the prowess of home rule that led to the founding of the Ulster Volunteers in 1912 and subsequently Redmond's call for the Irish party to support and join the Irish Volunteers in 1913. A year later in Feathert, there was a gathering of over a thousand volunteers including Michael, with 70 from Cunine and 110 from Drangan. As the 19 year old Michael Sadler watched the unveiling of the statue of Cusick, he didn't stand alone. Alongside him were friends and schoolmates who were a new generation of young radicals. Alongside him were his brother Tom, 20, his local friends like Tommy Donovan, who was 17 at the time, John Brett, 18, James Maloney, 18, Tom Cuddy, 15, Tommy Carroll, 15, and younger teenagers like his brother Dinny, who was 13, Nicholas Maroney, 13, Pat Maroney, 12, and even younger boys like Martin and James Bellady, Ernest Wilson, the Tansies, the Hackett's, and many more, and also boys from Cunine who would later join him in the C. Cunine Company. James Leeson, William Massey, 
Michael Power, and many, many more. All who would later go on and fight, and some die for the Republic. As the statue was unveiled, they would have read and be inspired by the inscription. He loved his country and served his kind. Go thou and do likewise. After the events of Easter 1916 and the executions, every time Michael Sadler and his friends entered this church, they would have a tangible and visual reminder of that historic event. The new marble altar, which replaced the old original timber altar, was made by the firm of Pierce from Dublin. And Willie Pierce, who was executed alongside with Padraig, was reputed to have had a hand in the sculptures. Michael Sadler joined C Company Cunin, 7th Battalion, 3rd Brigade, in 1917. All local companies received training under the command of Tommy, Tommy Donovan, with the help and skills of a man called Thomas Bush from Newtown, who had retired first gunner from the British Army and who had served in Gibraltar. And when Michael's brother Dinny returned from the front in France, he also put his skills to use in training local, local units. It was a 1918 general election which gave Sinn Féin and the volunteers the one thing they had lacked. And this was a mandate from the Irish people. They had been a legitimised republic. It's at this point where the Irish people say, we're not happy with home rule anymore. We want independence. We want the republic declared by Pierce in 1916. But despite Sinn Féin's clear mandate, mandate, Britain rejects the democratic will of the Irish people. The Sinn Féin representatives proceed regardless, and on the 21st of January 1919, they met and established Parliament in Dublin's Mansion House. Here, they declared an Irish Republic and prepared to stand for the right against Britain, whatever that may bring. We solemnly declare foreign government in Ireland to be an invasion. On this, the last stage of the struggle, we have pledged ourselves to carry through to freedom. On the same day, 100 miles away in Tipperary, a group of men from the Torch Bay Brigade at Salahat Beg ambushed RSE officers. This action was condemned by de Valera and the Dáil as their plan was to go to the Paris, P Paris Peace Conference and seek a resolution there. This, however, proved fruitless and so the War of Independence began. Michael was involved in activities both with local Cunin C Company and A Company Drangan, as well as other companies within the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. His skills and abilities saw him become a member of Dinny Lacey's flying column. Michael sadly saw many of his friends and comrades killed during the Tan War, including his brother Dinny. But Michael, alongside his brother Tom, continued the fight. When the truce was declared a month after Dinny's death, Michael would have gone to the training camp in Ballinard Castle, only a few miles from his home in Rackenny. And at the outbreak of the Civil War, Michael took the anti-treaty side and soon found himself following in Dinny's footsteps and became commandant of the 2nd Casual Battalion. To be raised to this rank was an indication of his dedication and skill. Meanwhile, back in Rackenny, his father Pat was involved in looking for a truce of some kind, and the following letter by him appeared in the Tamil Chronicle in October 22. Dear Sirs, having read the letters of Father Carlin and Madame Malcolm McBride, I am in entire agreement with their views. I know perfectly well that the soldiers on either side do not want to take the lives of their opponents. But of course, the Republicans cannot honourably surrender their arms. That would spell defeat. Why, then, not have the arms stored in armories under guard of men elected by themselves? One of my sons, Dennis, gave up his life for his country, and the others are quite ready to sacrifice theirs if need be. But God knows it is high time that we be once more united to work for the welfare of our poor, distracted country. Yours faithfully, Pat Sadler. A month later, Pat Sadler lost his second son, Michael, to the cause. The circumstances around, surrounding Michael's death are well enough known, but here's a short recap, mainly taken by Dan Breen. Shortly after midnight on Thursday, Friday, November the 2nd, 3rd, 1922, a party of free state soldiers left Cashel and began a house to house search, in the course of which they arrived at the house of William Heffernan of Marhill, which is near Newin. Commandant Sadler was sleeping there with a fellow officer, Paddy Lockton, 
when they were aroused by hammering at the door. The housekeeper delayed opening the door in order to give the two men time to get away. But on going downstairs, they discovered that the house was surrounded and escape impossible. If they fought, they would have no chance as it would be two against 50. They therefore took refuge in a hiding place under the stairs and before doing so, gave their guns to the housekeeper to hide. This was done because at this stage, it had been issued by the government that any man found with a gun would potentially be shot. If this count was, a correct, was a count to be correct, the two men were unarmed when their hiding place was discovered. On being discovered, they were ordered out and the officer in command of the raiders called on them to come forward with their hands up. One of the soldiers was holding a lighted candle and when the two men were called upon to come forward, this candle suddenly extinguished. It's not clear from the account given that inquest whether this was an accident or done deliberately. Immediately after the candle had been extinguished, shots rang out. According to the Free State version, <coughs> Sadler rushed at the Free State commander and grappling with him, tried to shoot him, but was shot himself by the commander. Sadler's companion then surrendered. It is also alleged by one of the Free State party that Commandant Sadler called for mercy.